Well, greetings everyone and welcome to part number five of the Business Ownership Workshop Series. My name is Mike Waller and I'm going to be your host for this session where we're going to talk about your marketing plan. As I've shared with you in the previous sessions, uh, this is a six-part series that's focusing specifically on what it means to actually get into business for yourself and some thoughts about how you approach it. So again, this is part number five, your marketing plan. If you had an opportunity to review the last session, session number four, you uh, will remember the fact that I uh, had a slide in there that talked a little bit about this importance of a plan, a business plan specifically. Uh, if you plan to fail to plan, uh, plan to fail. Uh, a strong statement, not necessarily 100% accurate, but unfortunately more right than wrong because people who don't have a plan wander me and meander uh, somewhat aimlessly at times. Um, I want you to make sure that you have clearly have a story and that you have a uh, strategy uh, before you start spending money on trying to get your business going. Uh, because I want you to be intentional. The devil is always in the details, as that old expression goes. Proverbs 16, 19 says it very well. The heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Don't forget to engage God in your journey. And you might find that he can bring you to places that you never ever thought you could achieve on your own and take the fear out of the daily challenges. The last session, we covered off some of the details of what a business plan includes, and one of those items was specifically the marketing plan. And so that's what this particular workshop session is going to be about, is talking more specifically about how do I put together that marketing plan? So what goes into your marketing plan? Well, it's, it's pretty well just a simple statement of who or what your target market is. What's the value proposition that you have to offer? Why would anybody be willing to buy something from you? Because at the end of the day, this has to be your strategy for how you're going to generate sales. If you do not have sales, then you might find yourself having a hobby that could be an expensive hobby if you're not careful. So we're also going to cover off some of the tactics of how are you going to attack the market? So this is really kind of what goes into a very high level, your marketing plan. So let's talk a little bit about your marketing strategy in a little bit more detail. Good product or service doesn't guarantee a successful business. You have to sell something. That's vitally important. So you have to know clearly who are your target prospects? Who are the individuals that represent the audience for whatever you have to sell, whether it's a product or a service? How are they gonna find you? How do you find them? Big difference there. It's important to think about, do I want to have a business where I can be aggressive about going out and marketing? And many times you might think about this in the context of a business-to-business uh, -business type of a business, where you go out, you create relationships, and you sell whatever the product or services you have to offer. However, there are some people that are intimidated by that, and they want to have a business that is going to let people come to them, and they will generate activity through advertising and promotion of some sorts. Uh, that would primarily be retail kinds of businesses in general. But again, it's important you identify how do you want to approach your marketplace. Short story for you. My family uh, is from St. Louis. My wife and I met in St. Louis uh, many, many years ago and her family was in the grocery business. Her dad's name was Fred, and he had several brothers who owned some grocery stores in St. Louis under a brand called Tomboy, which was back in the days of independent grocery stores. Anyway, uh, it was a retail kind of a business, and I had the opportunity to actually work in that business in my early career for a short time. Here's what I figured out within a year. I was not cut out for the grocery business. I learned a lot about the grocery business. I actually learned how to break down beef and how to cut chickens, which my wife loves because I can take a whole chicken and I can cut it apart in just a, a mere 30 seconds. But having said all that, uh, one of the questions that I asked my father-in-law, Fred, uh, was this. I said, Fred, if you had it to do over, would you go into this same kind of a business again? And Short order, he said, no. He said simply this. He says, I have to advertise and promote and wait for people to darken my doorstep. If I had it to do over, I would find a business that would allow me to go out into the marketplace, 
knock on doors, kiss babies, do whatever I had to do to generate activity because I feel like I would have control over that. That's a shoe leather kind of an experience. So I thought it was an interesting observation on his part and I considered him a very wise uh, individual who uh, learned from his experiences. One of the other parts of your marketing strategy is going to be how do you get the message out? Again, is it going to be an advertising strategy? Are you going to work with referrals through power partners? Are you going to use social media, uh, digital marketing of, of some sorts? What? You have to figure that out. A couple of important points that I want to make to you. One is understanding the demographics of your marketplace. Now, that may be a word you're familiar with or it may not be. In its simplest form, demographics just simply is a way of measuring the size numerically of your marketplace. You got to know who and what your target is, but you got to identify how big is it. One of the things I'm going to use through this particular session is a theme of elder care and assisted care because I think a lot of people can relate to it and also it's a pretty uh, interesting marketplace to size. So you'll find me referring to it uh, numerous times. But for example, in the elder care marketplace, and I shared this, I believe, in the last session, was that it is a marketplace that is expanding by 10,000 people every single day because 10,000 individuals are aging up to the age of 65 every single day. That's going to go on through approximately 2030, at which point in time there will be upwards of about 75 million people in the United States that will be beyond 65 years old and in many cases in need of care services of some sorts. So the answer to the is it growing question? Yes, it definitely is growing. You just have to figure out what percentage of it can you get? Who are the competitors out there? So these are all the demographics. These are size things that can be numerically quantified. Now there's another element to this that you wanna give consideration to and that is what we call the psychographics. As you might, uh, what you might interpret from the term psycho, uh, it actually refers to the psychology of how people make buying decisions. What are their lifestyles? How do they behave? What are the attitudes that they have? Why do they need your product or service? What are those buying habits? And being able to identify that. So for example, if you're thinking about marketing to a particular age group, let's say you were gonna to market to millennials, for example, and you thought, I'll do advertising in the yellow pages. Well, that's probably not gonna work out real well for you because the last time that a, a, a millennial actually looked at the yellow pages is probably never. They use these devices, we call them uh, iPhones or Android phones or iPads or tablets of some sorts. That's the way that they make buying decisions. They go out and they do some research. They check in with their friends, they use Yelp, they use a whole variety of different sources. So this is what we call the psychographics of the buying decision process. Now last time I also covered off this whole idea of a value proposition. And it is simply, what do you have to sell? What's the problem that you're solving for somebody or the need that you're fulfilling? And I'm gonna help you to understand this perhaps a little bit more in depth through an example. And this is a story of a business by the name of Pro Drape. Kind of a unique way to, well, to, to label it, if you will. Now, this is a good friend of mine. His name is Dave Walcott. And Dave is a very unique individual. Dave is a native of Barbados. And at the age of eight years old, he had a desire to learn how to play hockey. Not a lot of hockey played in Barbados. He was able to convince his parents to move to Montreal, Canada, where they became residents and he grew up and he learned to play hockey. Well, fast forward in this story, he uh, never got to the professional level, but he got very good at what he did and he moved into the coaching realm. He and his wife raised three kids. One of his sons, Danny, uh, was extremely good at hockey and he got drafted into the pros, uh, to the New York Rangers, a professional hockey team. In the process of being drafted into the pros, Danny found that uh, his hydration habits were not as good as they uh, should be, and he had lots of issues with cramping. And Dave was coaching him along and helped him to identify that, you know, your problem, Danny, is hydration. They tried some of the other natural ways, you might say. Uh, water wasn't getting it done for him, and Gatorade and Sport Aid and some of those products uh, just really weren't working. And so Dave came up with the idea, after he had done some research, of using coconut water because coconut water is supposed to be extremely uh, good for hydration and uh, again 
keep in mind, Dave is a hockey guy. He's not a business guy. He went out and did this homework, put Danny on a program of using Prodrate for a couple of weeks to see how it worked out. And after two weeks, lo and behold, the problems with cramping were being reduced dramatically. And Danny said to his dad, Dad, this stuff works great, but the biggest problem is, is it tastes like crap. Uh, so Dave got the idea and said, well, I wonder if we could flavor it in some way and turn it into a drink product that would be more flavorful, more tasteful. And so Ed, Dave created this whole idea around coconut water with natural flavorings because that was important to him that he find natural products to well to to put into it into his recipe if you will he branded it prodrate because he thought it was kind of unique because he saw his marketplace as being professional sports and hydration and so he was identifying this target market and he knew what was the need was because he said if danny's got this problem other people have to have the problem also um, he understood the benefits because he was seeing what was happening with Danny and he thought it's a pretty unique niche because at that time, this was back in 2014, August, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, and he was identifying the fact that there wasn't a lot of competition in this particular space. And so he thought, hmm, can differentiate ourselves. So he was uh, smart enough to get the product uh, copyrighted and trademarked. So they took the recipe because he had worked with a food chemist to help to um, uh, put together the recipes for this particular drink combination. Now, a number of things happened. Uh, in March of uh, 2015, Dave took the product live uh, with a case run of 40,000 cases. And he was out there on the the grid, if you will, trying to sell people on this idea. He had a measure of success here in the U.S. with it. In the meantime, Danny got traded to the Tampa Bay Lightning, which happened to be the location where Dave's uh, bottler was, because he had a co-packer who was based down in Tampa, Florida. And so Dave moved down to Tampa, Florida. Uh, and by the way, part of the story I left out was that he had actually moved to uh, Chicago, and where he and I met was at Willow Creek Church. And so anyway, Danny uh, started playing for the Tampa Bay Lightning and uh, working in one of their farm clubs uh, called the Syracuse Crunch. And so the product was really working for him. Dave was beginning to build a little bit of notoriety, but then lo and behold, his, his father became uh, ill and needed to uh, some assistance. And so Dave ended up moving back to Montreal, Canada. And so some of his, his progress here in the U.S. was halted a bit in terms of trying to get his name out into the marketplace because his long-term vision and ambition was hopefully we can build this into a significant product offering that one of the big guys is going to be willing to purchase. And so anyway, went back to Canada to be there uh, to take care of his dad and he auditioned for a program which is very similar to Shark Tank. But in Canada, it's called the Dragon's Den. But the concept is the same. It's investors who are willing to invest in people who have a great idea that they think can be taken to the next level. Uh, in, I believe this was 2018, mid-year, Dave uh, went to the audition, got accepted. They did the, um, uh, the taping for the program, but it wasn't going to air until November. So he couldn't tell any of us exactly what the outcome was. Lo and behold, whenever the... Uh, program was aired in November of 2018. Dave was offered an investment of um, a couple of hundred thousand dollars from several of the investors and they began to repackage and remarket the product in Canada. Now, why do I share this whole story with you? Well, you get an idea of the value proposition concept and you have to have a clear sense of what is your value proposition. Dave's had a tremendous success story with this. Uh, he's a good friend. I highly value our relationship. And it's neat to see an entrepreneur who didn't know anything about business that figured it out along the way, helped him in a number of different ways with some relationships and some conversations. And it's neat to see him having the success that he's having today. So what goes into your plan? Well, we're gonna break this into four parts. First is your products and services description. Second is your market analysis. How do you figure out where the market truly is? Third, what are the objectives and the tactics that you're gonna to use to actually attack that marketplace? And then fourth and most importantly, you gotta have some money to do all this on. So we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the budgets and the controls. So let's jump right into the products and services description. Well, it's a pretty straightforward question. What is it that you have to sell and what's the price that you're proposing to sell it at? Whether you've got product 
or you have services that you're going to offer. You have to simply define what are those things. You got an elder care business. You are going to be selling care services to families who have need of care services for some of their aging relatives, parents, grandparents, aunt and uncle, whatever that might be. However, there can be younger people that also have care service needs. So that can be a part of the marketplace. How are you going to charge for those services? If you have ever watched Shark Tank, you know that one of the things that they get into very, very early on in the conversation is tell me what your revenues are, tell me what your costs are, are you making any money, what are the margins on the product? Now, this term gross margin may be familiar or it may be foreign to you. Here's a simple example. If you sell a product for a dollar and it costs you 50 cents to make it, then your gross margin is 50 cents on that particular product. Extrapolate that for whatever the nature is of the product or service that you are looking to provide. So let's talk a little bit now about the market analysis. I think there are seven parts to this. We're going to take each of these particular sections apart a little bit more. So let's jump into the first one. Who is your customer or your client? Describe them. What do they look like? What's their age bracket? How do they make their buying decisions? These demographics are going to be very, very important. How many of them are there in the particular communities that you're looking to serve? Again, how do they make those buying decisions? What are the psychographics of, of their buying behaviors? You need to figure all this out so that you clearly have a sense of who your customer is. So how do you research that market? A couple of different ways you can think about doing it. Well, something we call primary research, where it's essentially exploratory, kind of open-ended, unstructured interviews, conversational, if you will, small group settings. Uh, question you might ask if you were looking to start an elder care business, you know, are you concerned about the care for your parents as they age? Uh, that can be tackled by maybe going to some uh, well, church settings and talking to people there that might be in some kind of a group setting. You can do it informally by maybe talking to some of your neighbors, some of your friends, your circle of influence, whoever it might be. You can also get into some very specific things, uh, looking for ways to solve that problem uh, in some particular way, and you might identify how much can your family afford for parental in-home care? So you begin to get an idea is what is the pricing and revenue tolerance? What's the elasticity of that? So that's what we would call primary research. Now there's also secondary research where you can find information that's available in the public domain, reading articles, going to the library, finding articles on elder care and assisted care and things of that nature, listening to the news because you might find that there's quite a bit of information out there in the marketplace already that can help you to get a good understanding of whether or not this particular marketplace is good for you. Now again, extrapolate this into your own idea and do some research, figure it out. How many prospects are there? What's the population of that marketplace? As I shared with you earlier, 10,000 people turning 65 every single day, 75 million by roughly 2030. What's the population of the marketplace in your particular target geographic area? How many of those prospects fit into that demographic? So you have to look at figuring out how many people might be potential prospects for you to sell to. Where are they located? What are the physical boundaries? If you take a metropolitan area like Chicago, you can identify areas that are more lucrative and those are less lucrative because some have a higher socioeconomic uh, status than others do. That's just the normal boundaries that exist within any geographic metropolitan area. But you need to know, what are those physical boundaries? How many prospects do I have within that particular area? And how am I going to go about finding them? Well, the Census Bureau, census.gov is a public domain website that the federal government maintains that allows you to simply go out and do a census if you needed to find out how many people with an income of $100,000 household income exist within these three geographic areas, uh, let's call them zip codes. You can find out that information through census.gov. However, there's some other resources that are available to you. They're called data aggregators. One of them happens to be a business called hoovers.com. Uh, and there's another one called NAICS. So hoovers primarily focuses on a lot of different kind of data 
that you might be able to specifically slice and dice. NAICS tends to deal more in the business to business marketplace. Don't underestimate the value of your local library. Uh, every library has a reference department. Here in the Northwest suburbs of Chicago, uh, you might find that the Schomburg Library, or the Barrington Library are both very good libraries. In the Western suburbs, Naperville has a very good reference department. Check in with them because they all have subscriptions to Hoover's and NAICS, as well as other data aggregator organizations that can help you to, again, size your marketplace. What's your value proposition? Again, I've emphasized this numerous times. What's the need of the problem that you solve? You got to know that. What's going to set you apart and make you unique from anybody else that's out there? Why is anybody going to buy anything from you? If you had the opportunity to sit through the very first session that uh, is a part of this series, you heard me talk about a uh, individual that I helped to get into a commercial sign making business. And his name is Jeff and he has a business called Divine Signs. And that business, uh, well, it's grown exponentially over the course of the last 17 years because they, Jeff was persistent and he helped to make things, uh, well, interesting for his clientele. And he started out with a tagline that was very simple. We're going to go out and make friends because friends make better customers. That was a simple strategy that he was employing to get his business off of the ground. Who is the competition? Do you know who the key competitors are? In Jeff's case, for example, 14 competitors at the time that he bought in, in Schaumburg alone, which is where his business is located. Are they direct or indirect competitors? Well, what do I mean by that? Well, here's an example. If you look at a food business uh, and you would say, I'm gonna open up a Subway shop. Well, you know that your direct competitors are Subway, Jimmy John's, um, uh, Jersey Mike's, and those kind of businesses. Indirect competitors are other food, fast service businesses. So people have choices. They go into a strip mall. Here's your Subway shop, but there's also a Pizza Hut. There's a Domino's Pizza. Uh, there is a Chipotle. There is a, a Bonavit. There are alternatives that people have for lunch. So those are indirect competitors for you. But you need to know who is my competition. You know, what's your competitive advantage? Again, what's going to set you apart from anybody else? Do you have a hot sauce that nobody else has figured out yet and that is going to be your competitive advantage? Well, hey, that, uh, uh, that could make a big difference for you. How are you going to sell? Where are you going to sell? Is it a business to business? Is it retail? Are you going to do it through direct sales of some sorts? Are you going to have distributors? So you're going to essentially be the wholesaler who sells to uh, distributors who distribute to a retail marketplace. Are you going to use the internet? Are you going to have just-in-time delivery, i.e. you make it and you deliver it at that instant, or are you going to maintain inventory? These are all things that affect the cost of operating your business. If it's a service, you got to describe. How is it going to be provided? How is it going to be sold? SWAT. Maybe this term is familiar to you, maybe it's not. It stands for this. You need to identify your strengths and your weaknesses in your company. You will probably know what are the things that you have strength in, i.e. you're an outgoing individual who loves interacting and talking to people, or you may say, that's a weakness in my company and I need to hire a salesperson who can help to sell because that's not my strength area. What are the opportunities that you can leverage? Well, again, if we're looking at the elder care business, you can leverage the opportunity that exists by virtue of the fact that 10,000 people are turning 65 every single day. You just have to know where they're at. What are some of the marketplace threats? What are some of the things that could potentially put you out of business? Could a, a big player come in and all of a sudden begin to dominate the market because they have the financial backing that allows them to cut prices substantially? Uh, those are the things you have to think about. That's why it's called strengths, weaknesses, or opportunities and threats. So are there demographic or psychographic trends, again, that work in your favor? So these are the things you need to keep in mind as you are doing your market analysis as to whether or not you have a product that really will work in the marketplace. Some of your objectives and tactics. And one of the things I want you to be able to define in your marketing plan is what are your objectives and your goals? And what are the tactics that you're going to be using to, to sell? So for example, I want you to get specific. 
each of your objectives should state your intent and have several goals along with those tactics for achieving those goals. So for example, I think your goals should be SMART. That's an acrostic that stands for specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time bound. That is a good goal whenever you can say, yeah, I know it's very specific. I know it's measurable. I believe it's attainable. Is it realistic? And over what period of time can I accomplish that goal? That's a SMART goal. So here's an example again with assisted care services. Your objective may be that you wanna tap into third party influencers. Now, who are those kind of people? Well, they're in the world of elder and assisted care. It could be churches, it could be medical practices, it could be any service, uh, government services that uh, recommend various different kind of care services, social services, if you will. Uh, they make recommendations to individuals who seek them out. Your goal may be to specifically establish relationship with six medical practices. So what you have to do then is establish your tactics to go out and figure out how am I gonna get myself connected into six different medical practices because that's my specific goal that I want to uh, achieve to tap into these third party influencers. So this is again, your marketing tactics or specifically how you're going to generate prospects. How are you gonna evangelize your product or service? How are you gonna make people aware of the fact that you exist out there? So again, if we think about some of these tactics, maybe a digital marketing campaign, the use of technology, the use of Google AdWords, the use of social media in some way to promote your business. Um, joining a chamber group or some kind of association is another way to get yourself exposed. Or maybe you want to develop power partner relationships. There are organizations that do rec specific recommendations of elder care services. They work with individual clients specifically and they will refer to various different assisted care type organizations. That may be uh, the equivalent of a power partner for you. And then needless to say, budget. You got to know how much money you have to spend and you got to know how much it's going to cost to provide different kinds of marketing activities. So it's important that you're able to define what's the cost for doing the various things that you're thinking of and then can I afford it? Always be prepared, just test and reassess. Nothing works 100% all the time. So don't be afraid to change something that's not working. That's the important thing of, of again, being intentional in your business plan and your marketing strategy, uh, but don't be afraid to change it if it doesn't work. I can tell you my friend Dave uh, and his ProDrate business, the first draft of his marketing plan uh, didn't work exactly like he thought it was. He tore it up, started over and rebuilt it and found some ways to get himself into 2,500 7-Elevens here in the U.S. because he wasn't afraid to try something different. So if you think about this, what's something that resonated with you from what I just shared with you? What are you going to do with it? That's the end of the day when you start to think about doing a business of your own. It's just that you have to be focused. You got to be intentional. You got to be prepared for start and stop you got to be prepared to just have the perseverance to stick it out so in the next section part number six i'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about what are some of the things i think you might want to consider doing next so it'll be somewhat of a summary of the things that we have shared with you over the course of these uh, five sessions so thanks again for listening i hope that you'll join us for uh, part six uh, of what do i do next of this particular workshop series on uh, business ownership and uh, thank you again for listening.